Welcome to The Fine Line. I'm your host, Stephen Vargas. This is a weekly show that will break through some of the noise and give you context to things that are happening in the world today. This is our first episode, so this is the most enthusiastic welcome. The Fine Line is part of the Lazy Geeks Network. You can find our other shows available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, basically anywhere you get your podcasts. If you want more information, you can check out our blog, at thelazygeeks.home.blog. This is the very difficult time we're going through. So much information and misinformation being thrown at us every second of every day. And we're not about being who's right or who's wrong, but we're more about context to things being said. Also, a bit of level-headedness, you know, to give some people some bearings. Yes, depending on your ideology, whether it be liberal or conservative, you may be offended. But sometimes, the context of things can be a bit painful. Now, on with the show. Not true. Who, who okay, you know what we're going to do? We're going to write up papers on this. It's not going to be necessary because the governors need us one way or the other because ultimately it comes with the federal government. That being said, we're getting along very well with the governors and I feel very certain that uh, there won't be a problem. Has yeah, please governor, go ahead. Has any governor agreed that you have the authority to decide when their state I haven't asked government? anybody. Because no I don't, you know why? Because I don't have to. Go ahead, please. But who told you the president has the total authority? Enough. You may have heard that clip on the nightly news back on April 13th. And it was in regards to President Trump claiming that he had the power to reopen the economy. There are two things wrong with that statement. One, he never shut down the country to begin with. It's the governors of their respective states that did. And two, the Constitution of the United States prevents him from doing so. Stady, starting with the first point, President Trump vehemently absolved himself of shutting the country down. Like many cities, like San Francisco, began stay-at-home orders in February as a preemptive measure. It wasn't until a month later that the governors of California and Washington state began statewide orders. Slowly but surely, more states started closing non-essential businesses and invoked stay-at-home orders. Meanwhile, the press, both liberal and conservative, were asking why President Trump should or shouldn't issue a nationwide stay-at-home order. Countless hours were spent on the primetime opinion shows on all channels debating the subject. And this leads into my second point. It's because he can't. By the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution, the president can't issue orders that affect states' rights. Now, don't get me wrong. Trump could say that he wants the economy slash government to shut down for a month. However, the states have the right to choose to accept it or not. He could urge states to comply, but that's the most he can do. The Bill of Rights that emerged, it was drafted by Madison, who was a Federalist, a centralizer, but he drafted it in a way to appease anti-Federalists. And from the beginning to the end, states' rights are an important idea of the Bill of Rights. The First Amendment says, Congress shall make no law. So restricting the federal government, not the states, the federal government. And the Tenth Amendment, which is the end of the Bill of Rights, is doing the same thing. It's imposing some limits on the federal government. 
and it reminds everyone that the federal government is a government of enumerated powers, that the federal government's power isn't complete and total, that state governments have important powers as well. The Tenth Amendment of the Constitution, a document which is a big deal for the members of the Republican Party, especially that second one, let it be known that the president or executive branch is not a king. He does not have broad powers. This is something you usually hear when a president signs an executive order bypassing Congress. They claim the Constitution is being violated. And in many instances, Trump's, Trump's orders would be met with the court challenges and would be blocked until it can be determined in the courts if the executive branch is violating states' rights. Fox News anchor Brett Baer, who is a fan of Trump, let it be known that he has lost his mind. In an interview with The Daily Briefing, the host asked Bear for his views on Trump and the governor's response to his ideas. Here's what he had to say. First of all, the Constitution is pretty clear, and the constitutional scholars will say that uh, this is not the president flicking on the switch. It's the governors and the local authorities that have that uh, going forward. I, I think that there's a hypocrisy here in that, you know, one, if President Obama had said those words uh, that you heard from President Trump, that the, the authority is total with the presidency, you know, conservatives' heads would have exploded across the board. Uh, two, a week ago, there was a lot of coverage of saying, why isn't there a national stay-at-home order? Why isn't there? Why don't they do this? But now it's, no, he can't open up. The, the bottom line is that the president can really influence these governors and work with them. But as far as the top-down order, by the Constitution, you, you can't do that. So it's working with these governors mm -hmm. to, to open it up in a rolling kind of open is, is what I imagine would happen. And they have worked that was something I have been saying all along. The president's powers is, are actually very limited in these cases. He can use the Defense Protection Act to force private businesses to develop critical materials for national use. However, he hasn't gone so far as to force any companies to comply. Why? Because they don't want to, and it hurts their, the free market. That's what the act is designed to do. Put the needs of the country ahead of profits. But recently, someone with a sixth grade social studies background got to the president, and he is now allowing the governors to call the shots which is how it was supposed to be anyway. Trump plays the wants to push buttons that even cuts off the power of Republicans in Congress. And that's a dangerous game to play. For a party that claims to like the Constitution, you can't cherry pick which parts to stand up for. For the left, you can't fight for the first and remove the second. And for the right, you can't fight for the second one and remove the first. We'll be back after this. Hey everyone, I'm Stephen Vargas. And I'm Adam Riley. Are you tired of BS internet news, sites and podcasts that don't seem to understand how movies, gaming, and simple business works? We do too. And? Oh, I don't have a solution. I was just saying we hate that stuff too. Stupid. We're the solution. The Lazy Geeks is a weekly podcast that takes an unfiltered look at geek and pop culture and removes all that clickbait clutter. We'll be talking about entertainment, gaming, comics, tech, and some of the most annoying social justice warriors that reside on Twitter. Don't forget conspiracy theories. We love to discuss different theories and explain just how stupid they are. Oh, if you're an anti-vaxxer, you should listen because you may actually learn something. <laughs> That's doubtful. We even dip into some politics and social norms that make absolutely no sense, as well as some geek subjects on technology, gaming, and social media. We have a diverse lineup for you. We discuss our favorite conspiracy theories, why do people still believe in ancient prophecies, some of the best software you should be using right now, and un an unpopular opinions episode. The Lazy Geeks will drop a podcast and YouTube version every Tuesday, so subscribe via your favorite GeoCities news group. You can... Even check out our blog at thelazygeeks.home.blog for our news content and updates on our upcoming shows. Have internet access? You can follow us on social media and let your voice be heard. Whether we want to hear it or not, be heard. You can follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash thelazygeeks, as well as Twitter and Instagram at thelazygeeks, all one word. 
be a positive force in the universe and check us out. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, and anywhere podcasts are available. Subscribe to The Lazy Geeks today. We're thinking so you don't have to. It was the most severe and deadly pandemic in modern history, the 1918 flu pandemic, also known as the Spanish flu. You might hear people comparing the current COVID-19 outbreak to that 102-year-old pandemic. So we wanted to break it down for you. First off, as we give a little history lesson on the 1918 flu, it was falsely dubbed the Spanish flu. We've all seen the news stories or old PBS documentaries about the Spanish flu, and they all seem like they were done in the 1980s. Even the ones done now, all of them have the film quality of the 1980s. So many people try to compare the two situations, and they are both similar and yet strikingly different. The major takeaways of this type of pandemic is how we as a people react to it. One of the biggest pandemics in the 20th century was the worldwide Spanish flu. The epidemic itself is a bit of a misnomer, Many people believe that it was started in Spain or had something to do with people of, you know, from Central or South America. In fact, it has nothing, there's nothing Spanish about it. The Spanish flu is about as, is to Spain like Taco Bell is to Mexican food. The flu itself broke out in the spring of 1918. It was the, in the waning months of the First World War. In fact, like revisionist history, the Spanish flu had originated in Kansas. Yep right here in the good old U.S. of A. It was believed that it was started in a backwater town in Kansas and tore through the town. If people had stayed within the town, the cases most likely would have stopped. However, it's believed that a few young people who were going into military service had taken it with them from their town and became spreaders that unleashed the largest global pandemic anyone had ever seen. Now, the first known case was reported on March 11, 1918, at a military base in Kansas. What was even more interesting is that it was largely contained to military personnel. Remember, we were still fighting World War I, so there were still massive troop movements which allowed the virus to spread at an alarming rate. Even troop carriers, which were done mostly by rail, allowed sick individuals to ming with, mingle with healthy ones. And this wasn't uncommon for many soldiers to arrive at their new posts either severely ill or dead. One of the first registered cases was Albert Gitchell, a U.S. Army cook at Camp Funston, Kansas, who was hospitalized with a 104-degree fever. It's always the cooks, isn't it? I mean, they're the ones with, like, the worst hygiene. Well, the virus spread quickly through the Army installation, home of 54,000 troops. By the end of the month, 1,100 troops had been hospitalized, and 38 had died after developing pneumonia. The reason a virus like this was allowed to continue unobstructed was because many people, due to the symptoms, believed it was like the normal flu. Yeah, that sounds a bit familiar. You hear most skeptics say that about COVID-19, that it's just like the regular flu. 60,000 people die of the flu every year, but we don't close the economy down. True, but while it's spread out over a 12-month period, it doesn't impact health care resources as 30,000 deaths in the space of a month. As the U.S. troops deployed en masse to the war effort in Europe, they carried the virus with them. Throughout April and May of 1918, the virus spread like wildfire through England, France, Spain, and Italy. An estimated three-quarters of the French military was infected in the spring of 1918, and as many as half of British troops. Luckily, the first wave of the virus wasn't particularly deadly, with symptoms like high fever and malaise, usually lasting only three days, and mortality rates were similar to the seasonal flu. Now, as summer approached, it appeared the flu was easing up as well. Many people thought the virus had run its course. That is a notion that Donald Trump is hoping for. However, like now, that may be the calm before the storm. Somewhere in Europe, a mutated strain of the flu virus had emerged. 
and that had the power to kill a perfectly young man or woman within 24 hours of showing the first signs of infection. It was the same misdiagnosis with COVID-19. It was claimed that only seniors could get the virus or that would be particularly deadly. So young people here would say that they didn't care if they got the virus because it didn't affect them. Like then, it started to take down people without pre-existing conditions. In late August 1918, military ships departed the English port of Plymouth carrying troops unknowingly infected with the new, far deadlier strain of the Spanish flu as these ships arrived in cities like Brest, France, Boston in the United States, and Freetown in West Africa. The second wave of the global pandemic began. The rapid movement of soldiers around the globe was a major spreader of the disease, says James Harris, a historian at Ohio State University who studies both infec infectious diseases and World War I. The entire military-industrial complex of moving lots of men and material in crowded conditions was certainly a huge contributing factor in the way the, panda the pandemic spread. Now, earlier I said that the Spanish flu did not come from Spain. As we are in a war, news of the pandemic was stymied by many countries participating in it. No one wants to know their enemy to know that they're impaired, which could somehow give them an advantage. However, Spain was a neutral country at the time, and no one censored their reporting. The press was free to report the killing nature of the flu and how it spread throughout the country. Hence, the world dubbed it the Spanish flu. As we know with time, that wasn't the case. From September through November of 1918, the death rate of the Spanish flu skyrocketed. In the United States alone, 195,000 Americans died from the Spanish flu in just the month of October. And unlike the seasonal flu, which mostly claims victims among the very young and very old, the second wave of the Spanish flu exhibited what's called a W curve. High numbers of death among young and old, but also a huge spike in the middle composed of otherwise healthy 25 to 35 year olds in the prime of their life. This really freaked out medical establishment that there was an atypical spike in the middle of the W, says Harris. Not only was it shocking that health, healthy young men and women were dying by the millions worldwide, but it was also how they were dying. Struck with blistering fevers, nasal hemorrhaging, and pneumonia. The patients would drown in their own fluid-filled lungs. You can almost see history repeating itself. Harris believes that the spread, the rapid spread of the Spanish flu in the fall of 1918 was at least partially to blame on public health officials unwilling to impose quarantines during wartime. In Britain, for example, a government official named Arthur Newsholm knew full well that a strict civilian lockdown was the best way to fight the spread of a highly contagious disease, but he wouldn't risk crippling the war effort by keeping munition factory workers and other civilians home. According to Harris's research, Newholmes concluded that, quote, the relentless needs of warfare justified incurring the risk of the spreading infection, end quote, and encouraged Bretons to simply carry on during the pandemic. The public health response to the crisis in the United States was further hampered by a severe nursing shortage as thousands of nurses had been deployed to military camps and the front lines. The shortage of was worsened by the American Red Cross's refusal to use trained African-American nurses until the worst of the pandemic had already passed. As history is tending to repeat itself because Americans either believe that the current coronavirus is just an overreaction by the media or that many conservative pundits claim it's fake news. The dangerous rise in cases is similar to what we saw in 1918. By mid-September, the Spanish flu was spreading like wildfire through Army and Naval installations in Philadelphia. But Wil Wilmer Curson, the Philadelphia Public Health D Director, assured the public that the stricken soldiers were only suffering from the good old-fashioned seasonal flu, and it would be contained before infecting the civilian population. Well, John Barry wrote in The Great Influenza the story of the deadliest pandemic in history when a few first few citizen, civilian cases were reported on September 21st. Local physicians worried that it could be the start of, a, of an epidemic, but Cruson and his medical board said Phil, Philadelphians could lower the risk of catching the flu by staying warm, 
keeping their feet dry and their bowels open, whatever the hell that means. A civilian infection rate climbed day by day. Krusen refused to cancel the upcoming Liberty Loan Parade scheduled for September 28th. Barry writes that infectious diseases expert warned Krusen that the parade, which was expected to attract several hundred thousand Philadelphians, would be, quote, a ready-made flammable mass for a conflagration. Krusen insisted that the parade must go on since it would raise millions of dollars in war bonds, and he played down the danger of spreading the disease. On September 28th, a patriotic procession of soldiers, Boy Scouts, marching bands, and local dignitaries stretched two miles through downtown Philadelphia with sidewalks packed with spectators. Just 72 hours after the parade, all 31 of Philadelphia's hospitals were full and 2,600 people were dead by the end of the week. George Diener, author of The Global Flu and You, A History of Influenza, says that while Krusen's decision to hold the parade was absolutely a quote-unquote bad idea, Philadelphia's infection rate was already accelerating by late September. The Liberty Loan Parade probably threw gasoline on the fire, says Daner, but it was already cooking along pretty well. While several states and municipalities are currently holding back on forcing a stay-at-home order, citing very low cases, the states of Washington, California, and New York are not waiting for it to get worse. At the same token, you may have many conservative pundits that are talking about reopening the economy because the hurt to the economy is worse than the hurt to the people. Well, unfortunately, when you have political leaders who fail to learn from history, they, we are doomed to repeat it. Back then, St. Louis decided that it was going to take extra precautions to flatten the curve. The public health response in St. Louis couldn't have been more different. Even before the first case of the Spanish flu had been reported in the city, Health Commissioner Director Max Starklov had local physicians on high alert and wrote an editorial in the St. Louis Dis Post-Dispatch about the importance of avoiding crowds. When a flu outbreak at a nearby military barracks first spread to the St. Louis civilian population, Starkloff wasted no time closing the school, shuttering movie theaters and pool halls, and banning all public gatherings. There was some pushback from business owners, but Starkloff and the mayor held their ground when an infection swelled as expected, thousands of re sick residents were treated at home by a network of volunteer nurses. Daner says that because of these precautions, St. Louis public health officials were able to flatten the curve and keep the flu epidemic from exploding overnight as it did in Philadelphia. It's that crush of new cases that is such a sh in a, such a short period of time that completely overwhelms the city's capacity, says Daner. That magnifies whatever problem you're already having a lesson that many deniers and skeptics fail to understand today, as you saw by all the conservative protests in several states last week. According to a 2007 analysis of the Spanish flu death records, the peak mortality rate in St. Louis was only one-eighth of Philadelphia's de death rate at its worst. That's not to say that St. Louis survived the pandemic unharmed. Daner says that the Midwestern city was hit particularly hard by the third wave of the Spanish flu, which returned in the late winter and spring of, of 1919. San Francisco took St. Louis's lead and tried to get ahead of it before it ravaged their city. Health officials put their full faith behind gauze masks. California Governor William Stevens declared that it was the patriotic duty of every American citizen to wear a mask, and San Francisco eventually made it the law. Citizens caught in public without wearing a mask or wearing it improperly were arrested, charged with disturbing the peace, and fined five bucks. In his book, Jacobs says that the gauze masks city officials claimed were 99% proof against influenza were hardly effective at all. San Francisco's relatively low infection rate in October was probably due to well-organized campaigns to quarantine all naval installations before the flu arrived, plus every effort to close early efforts to close schools, ban social gatherings, and close all places of public amusement. On November 1st, a whistle blast signaled that San Franciscans could finally take off their masks, and the San Francisco Chronicle described sidewalks and runnels strewn with a relic of a torturous month. But San Francisco's luck ran out when the third wave of the Spanish flu struck in January 1919. 
Believing masks were what saved them the first time, businesses and theater owners fought back against the public gathering orders. As a result, San Francisco ended up suffering some of the highest death rates from the Spanish flu nationwide. The 2007 analysis found that if San Francisco had kept all of its anti-flu protections in place through the spring of 1919, it could have reduced deaths by 90%. As we could experience here, as we see happening in some other countries, the initial wave of the coronavirus may not be the only one. Viruses mutate, as did the Spanish flu. The initial cases began in March of 1919 and ran through August. And as we can see now, people can figure that if we dodge the bullet, we can go back to normal life. However, the second wave of the Spanish flu returned in September of 1918 and had passed by December. However, the second wave of the Spanish flu returned in September 1918 and had passed by December. But it wasn't over, not by a long shot. A third wave, a third wave erupted in Australia in January 1919 and eventually worked its way back to Europe and the United States. It's also believed that President Woodrow Wilson contracted the Spanish flu during the World War I peace negotiations in Paris in April of 1919. The mortality rate of the third wave was just as high as the second, but the end of the war in November of 1918 removed the conditions that allowed the disease to spread. Global deaths from the third wave, while still in the millions, paled in comparison to the apocalyptic losses during the second wave. It is important to bear in mind that this was before supersonic air travel, open borders in Europe and the United States, continental travel. During the Spanish flu, a global war helped in the spread of the disease. And when you look at our current situation, the military has just started to see a growth in cases after the outbreak in the civilian population. Currently, we have younger people defying orders to stay at home because the media claim that younger people are not susceptible to the virus. Unfortunately, in an age where science and intelligence is demonized, no one truly understands how a virus works. Just because you aren't sick doesn't mean you can't give it to someone else, primarily someone with a severe condition. While many of our political officials are trying to get in front of this, we have a selfish, arrogant, and ignorant culture that worry more about likes on Instagram than the lives of someone they claim to love. Think about it for a moment. What if you're responsible for the death of a friend, a relative, a sibling, a significant other? Can you live with that? Remember that the next time you hang out with your friends or have a party while Snapchatting your arrogance. If you care, if someone you care for or share a house with or visit dies, now that's on you. Over a hundred years after the Spanish flu, it seems that while some of us listen to the people that know what they're talking about, it also seems like there are many others that are making the same damn mistake. As the old saying goes, those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And that's our show. Thank you for joining me on our first episode. New episodes of the show will drop every Wednesday. If you would like more content or want to check out the other shows on this network, you can head over to our blog, thelazygeeks.home.blog. And if you like what you heard and would like to help us out, these things cost money and time. So if you would like to donate to our PayPal account, just head over to our blog and click on the donate button on our site. If you can't help us out monetarily, you can always help us out by reviewing the show on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever you can. That helps raise the profile and gets our content out there. You can also follow us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, at The Lazy Geeks. And you can listen to all our content, even old versions of this show, on our YouTube channel. Drop us a comment or suggest a future topic to discuss by emailing me at thefinelinemail at gmail.com. So thanks for tuning in, and we'll get back to you next time. I'm Stephen Vargas, and this was The Fine Line.